Video 2, Arrival at Santos. This poem is about arrival, as you can tell from its title, about first seeing a foreign country. It was written at the beginning of the age of globalization, and the speaker arrives with, uh, by ship, not by plane. Thus, she can savor and contemplate arrival a little longer than is common today. Santos is a port city not far from Sao, pa Sao Paulo. It is a good place to enter Brazil. I will read the poem with you, but will not dissect each and every line because it's a little long. And um, after at the end, I'll give a summary of my interpretation and some emphasis. So to begin with, the speaker is on a ship and finally sees land after traveling uh, for about two weeks from the United States. And she says, here is a coast, here a harbor. This opening sounds like a children's rhyme. Here is the church and here is the staple. There's something sing-songy and therefore lacking in excitement about it. Maybe not what you'd expect from finally arriving at your uh, desired destination. It's just here. Here it is. Here is a coast, here is a harbor, it's just here. The speaker seems not very excited, but a rather tired, bored. Here, here, here. Here, after a meager diet of horizon, after all these weeks of just seeing the ocean, compared to a boring um, diet of food, is some scenery. Scenery means view, landscape, but again, it's very vague, non-committal word. There's no excitement about Santos. There's no excitement about scenery, just some scenery. It's not beautiful scenery. Even just the word scenery is sort of lackluster and lacking of excitement. In practically shaped, practically shaped and who knows self-pitying mountains sad and harsh beneath their frivolous greenery the speaker is unimpressed even by the mountains the mountains uh, seem self-pitying perhaps she is projecting her own self-pity for being disappointed and, and not excited uh, by seeing the mountains, she projects it, she sends it over to the mountains and sees the mountains of Brazil as self-pitying. With a little church, and this is another callback or reference to the children's rhyme that I mentioned earlier, on the top of one of, one of the mountains and warehouses, some of them painted feeble pink or blue in some tall, uncertain poems. She paints us a picture of what she sees. We may imagine that she was expecting something very different from what she knew. But what she sees is associated with feebleness, weakness. The impression is not as strong as she wanted. Poems don't grow very well in the north of the US where she's from. They are there sh they should be associated with uh, the tropical climate of Brazil. She does um, sh uh, like she might have expected, like she might have wanted, but she and she does see uh, the palms, but instead of lush tropical groves of palms, like you might in imagine or you might see in a commercial to come visit Brazil, no, she only sees some, not a lot, just a couple, just some. She projects a sense of uncertainty onto them. The view is so underwhelming and even the palms seem unsure of themselves, uncertain palms. So much effort to travel. She put in so much effort to travel down south and all she sees is more uncertainty. Now midline, we have a turn to the tourists. I think the tourist is the speaker herself presented here in her role as a tourist rather in a, than as a poet or a speaker or 
um, something else. Her identity here is reduced to that of a tourist. And the, the poem says, oh, tourist, is this how this country is going to answer you? And your immodest demands for a different world and a better life and complete comprehension of both at last and immediately after 18 days of suspension, these five lines are one rhetorical question. The sense of disappointment remains, but we get a sight of what the speaker was expecting. The uncertain palms, etc., seem to be a reply to unreasonable demands. She calls them immodest. That is, immodest is something that you shouldn't, you might want to say in private, but not speak aloud. You might want, you might think it, but it would be uh, immature and, uh, and problematic to speak it out loud. Her demands were immodest. I think you can translate it into unreasonable. Brazil was supposed to be a different world, even though we know that it's on our planet, and a better life, a way to change how you live, maybe change who you are, and in addition, also offer complete comprehension of both at last. Like she was looking for the meaning of life, the meaning of the world, understanding, and she expects to find it all in Brazil, but it's probably not going to be there. So she wants a better world, a better life, understanding of both, and all that from Brazil and all that immediately. How do I know that this is presented as unreasonable? unreasonable just well, apart from logically, how can you expect all that? Beyond the fact that, that new world, new life and understanding are a, just a lot to demand from scenery, from, a la from landscape, there are adjectives uh, interspersed in the question that suggest uh, exaggeration. There are an, adjective and adverbs uh, that suggest exaggeration and hyperbole, like complete, like all of it, not partial, just complete understanding and immediately, not eventually, not, not with time I might get some new insight. No, I want it now, the minute I near the shore. You can't possibly expect all that and expect it the moment you saw the country. Even if you were waiting in suspension just for something to happen for over two weeks. Bishop may be suggesting that our expectations of our travels are unrealistic, cannot be met by reality. We want to uh, travel to provide us with earth shattering results, but no matter how far we travel, we are still on the same earth and no matter how far we travel, even, to, even if you go to space, we remain the same people with the same lives. So sometimes we expect impossible things from travel. Uh, after all these over the top expectations, uh, there's a return to the trivial and the everyday. Finish your breakfast. The tender is coming. A tender is a small boat that takes people to and from large ships. A, a strange and ancient craft plying a strange and brilliant track. So that's the flag. I never saw it before. I somehow never thought of there being a flag, but of course there was all along. Before seeing the flag as a flag, it sh she calls it a rag, just a piece of cloth without significance, something you may use to clean things with. The choice of words suggests how her consciousness moves from not recognizing the object for what it is, for what it symbolizes, to recognizing it. The speaker realizes that there must be a flag, even if she did not think about it. Right, the idea of the Brazilian flag enters her mind and we see it enter through the changing vocabulary.
from rag to flag. And of course, it also rhymes. So there's a collect connection, an extra connection between these words. Why is she surprised though by there being a flag? Why is the Brazilian flag surprising? Flags are, first of all, a symbol of nationality and independence. Has she never thought of Brazil as a nation, as somewhere with independence, with its own life? Perhaps for her, like for many tourists, uh, she thought of Brazil as a destination, as somewhere uh, exotic that will renew her, that will give her a new life. It wasn't a place where people live and feel proud and patri patriotic about. It's not a place that needs a flag. The fact that she did not know that the flag, uh, the flag at all suggests furthermore that she does not know much about her destination. She didn't even bother to look at its basic symbols. Uh, she came to do something for herself, not out of connection, to the new place. This is part of being a tourist um, for many people. You often travel to, new, to a new place, but you do not care that much about that place. All you want is something new for yourself. You often hear people wanting to go on vacation or go somewhere new. And the exact uh, destination uh, is not determined by any draw to a specific location. It's not like I always wanted to go to Budapest. It's just have a good deal to go to Budapest and I just want a vacation, just to want to travel. So the specific location as marked by the flag is less important. The fact that I'm going to be a tourist and I'm going to renew myself by traveling or get something that I want by traveling is much more important than the specificity of the location. And I think that's part of what uh, Bishop is trying to show us with this idea of never thinking about the flag of Brazil. And then she continues, okay, of course they have a flag and coins, I presume, and paper money. They remain to be seen. Currency, money, is also a mark of independence and nationality, a sign that you are in, uh, in another country. When you, have, when you see different coins, you know that you're in a different country. However, they're also quite trivial everyday objects, not something exciting. Even though almost every country has its own currency, few people actually travel just for the enjoyment of experiencing a different kind of currency. In fact, uh, changing money and getting used to foreign money is one of the small inconveniences of travel. Bishop includes them as part of the depiction of the bigger disappointment with travel and also to suggest again, as with the flag, how uninterested uh, uh, the speaker might be in the specific of the place or in the everyday life of the place. She just, she's on her way to somewhere else and just the small things like changing money are not that interesting, interesting for her. Gingerly now we climb down the ladder backward, myself and a fellow passenger named Miss Brin, descending into the midst of 26 freighters waiting to be loaded with green coffee beans. Please, boy, do be more careful with that boat hook. Watch out, oh, it has caught Miss Brin's skirt. Miss Brin is about 70, a retired police lieutenant, six feet tall, with beautiful bright blue eyes and a kind expression. Her home, her home, when she is at home, is Green Falls, New York. First, let me point out there's an extreme enjambment here. An enjambment is a break in the line in the middle of a sentence. And in this case, the break is in the middle of a word and between two stanzas. 
This is a very rare in poetry, but it does happen sometimes in modernist poems, in uh, poems of the 20th and 21st century. Why does Bishop do this here? Why breaking up the word? So the name of the town that she breaks up is Glens Falls. It's a real town in upstate New York, in North New York. Uh, falls as in waterfalls, but the extreme in German make it, makes it look as if the S itself is falling from the word. We are dropped, like if we follow the poem with our eyes, we are dropping together with the S, making us feel the drop that you have in the name, like the water falls, the water falls, the S falls, the name falls. Uh, why, but we can still ask why uh, did Bishop include this name? The real, it's a real place, but and maybe her travel companion was actually from there, but what, she didn't need to include the name in the poem. Uh, why does she um, choose, once she uses this name of a place, to emphasize its fallenness and its being broken up by dropping the S to the next uh, stanza? I think it has to do with the status, uh, its status, uh, Glens Falls, um, as a home for the other tourists, Miss Spring. Travel, being a tourist, momentarily destabilizes our relationship with our home. The normal way to talk about someone's place of residence is to say her home is Glens Falls. But Bishop adds, she doesn't, doesn't just say that she's from Glens, Glens Falls or her home is in Glens Falls, but she uh, writes when she is at home suggesting strangely that suggesting strangely that when uh, she is not at home in Glen Falls, Glen Falls may not be her home. As if once you're not at home, that home is not your home anymore. And indeed traveling going on vacation makes you ask the question of home. If it's your home and you feel comfortable there and it's the place you're supposed to be, why are you traveling? So it makes you, makes the connection with home and what is a home and who belongs at home um, up for questions momentarily, not as a tourist, you are temporarily without a home. Travel makes you question the fact that you have a home at all. You don't see it, you're not connected to it. Maybe there's nobody there. This is a strange idea, I know. It's not like every time you leave your home, you feel like you're homeless. Even if you're traveling for uh, six months, you still feel you have a home back home, but Still, it's not the same as being there every night and every day. And more generally at home in, uh, can mean literally being in your house, in the house that belongs to you where you live, but it can also figuratively mean uh, feeling comfortable. Like in the saying, make yourself at home or I feel at home. It means make yourself comfortable. Miss Breen is not feeling at home right now because she's out of her country. She's in a new country. She's worried maybe, she's tired. She's not comfortable. She's not at home in the two senses of the word, of the expression. Uh, at least not feeling at home yet. And, uh, and Bishop emphasizes this. So her connection to her home is destabilized by this discomfort and not knowing exactly what's going to happen next with her travels. Now, this is an, a strange idea, but I think part of what poetry can give us is uh, new ways to look at things that seem obvious to us. And Bishop really 
shows here how uh, travel and the connection to home can uh, be connected. There, we are settled. The customs of officials will speak English. We, and by we, she means I think us tourists, she and Mr. Miss Green, hope, we hope that they speak English. We want a new place, but we want the transition to be smooth. We don't have want to take the trouble to learn uh, Portuguese. We want them to speak our language because we're just tourists. We're just here for a while. We don't have to adjust ourselves uh, to them. And we hope that they don't only speak English, but leave us our bourbon and cigarettes. So they hope not that they don't confiscate these items from home. It will make life more convenient and comfortable. Both uh, bourbon and cigarettes are psychoactive. Cigarettes uh, calm smokers down and bourbon, American whiskey can calm you down or make you happier, depending on how alcohol works on you. As a tourist, you may need them to handle the new land. You need something to soften you up to make you feel more comfortable. And the fear vis-a-vis -vis the custom officers in, in the port is that they will take these comforts away from you and make you face the new country without the things you like from home. Ports are necessities like postage, stamps, or soap. She reminds herself that the port is just a transition, not the real thing that they came to see. It's just a necessity, not the main event. And in a way, she's saying the destination is important, not the way, but they seldom seem to care what impression they make the ports or like this only attempt since it does not matter. The unassertive colors of soap or postage stamps wasting away like the former, slipping the way the latter do when we mail the letters we wrote on the boat, either because the glue here is very inferior or because of the heat. We leave Santos at once. We are driving to the interior. They leave Santos at once, immediately, not wanting to stay in the uncomfortable transition between ocean and the new land that the port represents. After the disappointment, the poem moves to a kind of optimism. The disappointment of the port will be over and we will go on to the real thing, the interior. The port is just a necessity. The disappointment is just a necessity. The real thing is still in front of us. That's the interior. We're driving to the interior. Literally, she means the interior of Brazil, not the coast, but the jungles and mountains going to the place where she wants to be. Symbolically, we can see the interior otherwise. It could be going back to her interior uh, self or interior life of things, the world that she's trying to comprehend, to understand completely, like she said earlier. She's still hoping that Brazil will give her some renewal or understanding. We are left to wonder uh, to what extent driving to the interior will answer uh, what she wants from Brazil, the demand that she has from Brazil, and to what extent her demands are uh, still unreasonable as they were earlier in the poem. To sum up, arrival at Santos speaks of the expectations and their inevitable disappointment that uh, tourists have an experience. Uh, tourists often do not care or know what much about the place they are visiting. Ob obviously, they travel for their own purposes, whatever they are, even whether they're spiritual, like Bishop presents it, uh, curiosity, renewal, uh, or even if it's just uh, fun and relaxation. Tourists often 
just travel for some personal interest. At any rate, often tourist expectations will be too high and the new place cannot answer all of their demands because it's busy, you know, doing its own thing. The people there, the country just exists without caring about the tourist demand too much unless they work in tourism. This is especially true of the transitional space like the airport or the seaport in the poem. These places are not there to answer your demands, they are there to go through and travel through. And yet one does keep traveling, right? Driving to the interior, not giving up, out of hope that there's somewhere beyond the transition, beyond the disappointment, and uh, and discover maybe beyond all that something that was worth traveling for something that uh, in the poem is called the interior <laughs> 